Aotearoa's Hauraki Golf Marine Park, Te Kapa Moana and Te Moana Nui Atoi, stretching from Te Arai to Waihi. Beautiful, biodiverse, unique in our world. A treasure for tangata whenua, it's always provided what we love and what we need. From above it looks spectacular, but beneath the surface, it's a different story. It's actually on the brink of ecological collapse. How did this happen? And what can we do? In this series, we'll take a deep dive into the Hauraki Gulf to understand what is making our sea sick. In this episode, we take a look in the mirror. Have we drifted away from nature and our humanity? What's the path back? Without hope, are we hopeless? There's hope in the fact that all of the pieces of the jigsaw still remain in the Hauraki Gulf. We still have snapper. We still have the bare minimum of crayfish. We still have every single part of the puzzle, even if it's at very, very low abundance. We can still come back from here, but we've got less than a decade to do it. If we fail to turn the corner now, it won't happen. We are already in ecosystem collapse. We need action now. Now it's coming back on us because we're so far out of uh, balance and proper relationship with um, the entire planet, and there's so many of us, that we're traumatized. We're traumatizing ourselves. I think globally, we're dealing with some really large and complex issues. Um, global warming, pandemics, there is, there is green fatigue out there. I think that's really true. People have heard a lot about things, and often it's information that they, you know, it, it's not meaningful to them. They're scared by it. They're overwhelmed by it. And when you have that kind of information thrown at you on the daily, you tend to put it in the too hard basket. It's just too hard to action or even to think about. I think a lot of young people nowadays have such climate anxiety. You know, they're, they're scared. They don't know what to do. You know, you've, you've got 14 year old kids with having an existential crisis over the state of the world. And what I think these kids need as much as hope for the Gulf is hope for themselves. I think the younger generation, um, many of them are angry. And so they're, just focused on blaming our generation. A huge amount of dissatisfaction with the way we've managed uh, things, and we're leaving them a planet that is compromised in its ability to even replenish and survive. So climate change is a major issue. And whether you accept it's man-made or not, it's real. The thing that causes fatigue or burnout or anything like that, climate distress, is what you're paying attention to, right? Biologically, through evolution, we're the ones that survive by focusing on, on danger. So we're wired to pay attention to negative things. There's 70% less wildlife today than there was when I was born. So we're in this existential crisis, which is scary as hell. That shift in human consciousness is happening. We are changing the way we think about and relate to uh, the natural world. So have we simply drifted away from nature? Why? Well, it's a very big story about how the West lost connection to nature, but is found in the Judeo-Christian worldview of the Old Testament of man shall have dominion over the earth. Um, where the earth is no longer a place of spirit and sacredness and numinous power. Rather, uh, all uh, numinous power or sacredness has been drained from the world and placed in a thing called God who resides outside of the world in a place called heaven. So the, the world is no longer God. The world is a manifestation of God's creative power, not God him itself. Invariably, he's a him. So it's, uh, it's never, it's, so it's been drained of all this tapu and so on. And this is what happened in our communities when the biblical worldview arrived. But the cost of it has been the detriment of the natural world itself. 
if we think about the Old Testament and some of the quotes that were in the Old Testament, let thy man rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, it was a interesting shift where nature was not only perceived and conceptualized as separate from humans, but that humans were also superior to nature. I don't know how many of us are looking out into the ocean and realizing how dependent our survival and the survival of our kids and our grandkids are on the health of that ocean. We take more than we give. We take more than we should be leaving behind and we put ourselves first and we don't put the environment first. There's a lot of ignorance going on. We just kind of think, oh, she'll be right. And that's not the case anymore. The earth needs a breath. The sea, sea life needs a breath from us humans who are just born killers. <laughs> you know, give them a chance. Scientists estimate that every second breath that we take is coming to us from the ocean. It's been acting as a carbon sink for, you know, the very least my lifetime. So I think it's really hard for people to connect with what's wrong or what they could be doing differently. They never saw a world where there were seabirds everywhere and, you know, fish for miles and dolphins jumping around. So they don't even know what they're missing. How do we get people to care? We've got to connect them. We've got to connect them to the environment. They've got to take off their shoes and put their feet in the water. We are part of nature, we're not separate from it. If we are going to have a long-term future as a species, we're going to have to change this idea because if we continue thinking that we are not part of nature, then we as a species do not have a long-term future. So, we have a choice to focus on the collapse or to focus on the sort of solutions. Why is it that, that um, people, when they go to sea, you know, think they should be able to take everything in, in a way that they wouldn't do it on land. We behave differently on the land because we live on the land and because we can see the consequences of our actions. We do not live in the sea and this mirror surface allows us the privilege of not seeing the consequences of our actions. I think many people see uh, the ocean as limitless and whatever's in the ocean is limitless. So fish, I think, are perceived a little differently from a deer or a lamb. We seem to have no visio-emotional connection to fish. There's probably something about not really being able to see what's happening underneath the waves. It's also probably got something to do with not looking something in the eye as you kill it. But in our daily lives, we are floating over this amazing piece of water. We, we feel it, that green New Zealand bliss. Aren't we lucky? What a fantastic country. Look at this gulf, look at these beaches. Well, I'm sorry. Get your goggles on and get down there and have a look and stop what's happening. Is it blind greed or ignorant bliss or both? The challenge is that the marine space is a common space, it's for everyone. It's not just for every person, it's for everything that lives in it as well. There's this concept of being able to extract when I want to, where I want to. And if you talk to most reasonable fishers, they'll all say, yeah, I don't mind if there's a bit of marine protection, but I don't want you doing it in my favourite fishing spots. And of course, when you talk to every fisher, there's nowhere left that you can actually close up. In Mātara of Māori, the word we use is apo which is greed. It's one of the things that exists in the human spirit that corrodes the life-giving, the life-firming activities, of uh, energies of a person and of a community. Does the everyday uh, family, they go out on their boat for a wonderful day out, which I think is great, do four persons in that boat all need seven fish each? I don't think so. You know, it's always about uh, quantity and about, uh, not necessarily just about um, what you need just to sustain yourself. That greed thing's a strange thing, you know, why you feel you need to catch the biggest fish and show it off, or why you feel that you need to take heaps and heaps. We always joke about it, you know, you're not a man until you've caught a 20 pound snapper, you know, you've, you've, you've just, have, you haven't, fa you've failed in life, you know, so. I think that people take as many fish as they can and put them on a big stringer and solely on not having any empathy for the suffering of that animal. Oh, well, fish will feel pain. Yes, fish will feel pain, pain for sure, yeah. I struggle with the concept of trophy fishing. I don't understand why getting the biggest animal is something that we should be proud of.
They're sociopaths. <laughs> we have presidents like that. <laughs> it's like everyone's a looter, and you're out for your you're out for yourself, and it's you know, and it's a it's a race, you know. Yeah. And then you get home and you share that what you've scored on Facebook. So how do you hang on greed? What we have to get away from is being driven by consumerism, individual greed, for the greater good of everybody. Our rights and our responsibilities have become divorced from each other. And so maybe people for some reason don't feel so connected to the Hauraki Gulf anymore, or maybe they feel powerless. We need to actually make some sacrifices, and if we make those changes, we're going to protect this environment, we're going to protect what we have. And that's, it's, it's not about us, it's about our grandkids. Shared responsibility is future oriented and it's based on what are we not doing. So it's actually quite nice to feel like you are part of something bigger that might create a big change. What we need to universally agree on is the need to prioritise the health of the environment. The environment in general has to be a priority. We've got to shift those mindsets of what it is that I want to take to what I should be leaving. Is it time to look at the golf in a whole new way? Is there hope? One of the most amazing things that we've done as a nation is to take the idea of a river and land and forests and oceans and, and weave in an ancestral Māori way of seeing and making sense of the world and to give a river legal personality. Why couldn't we do that for the Gulf? You know, what would it say? And it would say, help me, you know, renew myself and be able to be great again. Te Moana Nui o Toi already has its own modi. It already has its own life force. Legislating this is another part of the process. What on earth would you see if you let it, let it recover? There is good news. I mean, you look at the kinds of actions that we've undertaken on the land, on the whenua, and we've seen that we can regenerate native flora and fauna, that we can bring back native birds even to urban landscapes. Those same things can happen in the ocean if we dedicate ourselves to it. What I would love for the future is that we see, we feel, we taste, we hear the abundance and the beauty that is the moana and that will come when it's taken care of. I think we will have a big network of marine protected areas and that we'll see those flourish. I think we'll, we'll get trawling out of most of the Gulf at least. Well, I think we've lost so much in such a small period of time. Um, it's something that we have to be better and you know, we can be. And you know, we all benefit from a healthy and a productive ocean. This is our responsibility, our moment, and we need to work together before it's too late. The oceans can restore themselves. Like, it's not like it's finished, it's all over, it's far from it. Like, actually, if we stop destroying the oceans, they will recover. <laughs> I have faith in the fact that Gaia is a self-regulating organism, and she will bring us to heal. <laughs> what about our tamariki? We'd move heaven and earth for our kids. Do you think they'll appreciate our legacy? Or are they the ones that'll have to clean it up? It is the activism, the advocacy, and the unashamed, unapologetic fight for all of our lives that is being led by young people across not only this country, but across the world. Uh, that next generation and the generation after that are anxious. They want to know what sort of world they're going to have, where their food's going to come from, um, can they go swimming? So I would hope that we can get alongside our younger people and just give them guidance. At the end of the day, it is their future and their, their commitment and everything else makes me very proud. The solutions are coming in the young people. They're coming in the kids that we take out to tree planting events. They're bringing up the solutions now. My eight-year-old daughter said, how about we have half the area marine reserve or protected and the other half for fishing? 
I was like, well, that, that sounds like a pretty sensible idea. She should be minister yeah. for some reason. <laughs> I do love the ocean and I do think we should treasure it and take care of it because I don't want to lose it. And I know many other people wouldn't want to lose it as well. Hmm. So most of the time I have authentic hope, but even on the days that I don't, you just have to dig deep and be hopeful because the alternative is, is what? That we just give up? It's getting to a life and death situation. It, 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 it is going to come down to survival if we do or don't have a thriving Hariki Gulf and a thriving environment to support us. So that's my challenge to the people of my generation and those in power now. Take a load off these young ones and get this bit at least right. Because if things can be different with different decisions being made, then let's force those different decisions to be made. And we do that by mobilising as a country, as a community. I'm in, fishing gumboots and all. Tell me what I can do. You know, people do need to do a bit more than signing a petition. Um, you know, people need to be vocal and people need to make demands of the, of the politicians that represent them in their area. But if there's enough people power and public pressure and the government actually listens to that, um, then potentially you could have some really positive outcomes. But you can't leave it to individuals. It's government and government action through policy changes, through protection measures, through constraints on fishing that makes the real difference. There's a lot of work to be done and, and I think everyone needs to keep on both the council's and government's case, um, you know, to keep them on the task and make sure it happens. I think we reached that low where we just had to act. And now we are all around the Gulf. Governments acting, councils acting, communities, mana whenua, all showing leadership. We have to get people to care by showing them how bad it actually is by taking photos and organising cleanups and just showing people what we can do to help. Politicians are realising that there is a groundswell of change in the political lobbying and the votes that they might get. So they're forced into considering these things rather than taking them on board in a timely, intelligent way. They're driven by political force. And that's coming through the groundswell of our people. Why not try something? If we do nothing, nothing happens. If we try something, something beautiful could happen. There's never been a door this open ever in my adult life in terms of, of campaigning on these issues. So they've just got to set a plan uh, involve iwi, involve councils, and get out of each other's way so we can do things. If we could get it right in the Hauraki Gulf, you could get it right anywhere in New Zealand. Actually, you know, you could get it right anywhere in the world. The journey to get there will take the courage of many iwi, will take the goodwill of our government, of our ministers to support. And if a country like New Zealand can't get on top of our share of the world's environmental problems, then who can? And that's why, for me, as Minister of the Environment and Minister of Oceans and Fisheries, I really feel almost a moral responsibility that New Zealand show that we can make progress so that rather than being another source of despair in the world, we're a source of hope that other countries can look to to see that you can do better and that you can live a healthy, prosperous lifestyle without ruining the environment. In this series, we've talked about the problems facing the Hauraki Gulf and potential solutions to heal the hurt. Commercial fishing want to keep bottom trawling. Wreck fishers are all for change in conjunction with commercial review. Māori favour dynamic rahui over no-take marine reserves. Councils are struggling with runoff and silting and politicians haven't done enough fast enough. Agendas and self-interest need to be put aside so we can act in the best interest of the Hauraki Gulf. But there is good news. Since we started the series, the poor pink mau from episode one are now protected. Six rahui are in place. Revitalising the Gulf is underway and a large no-take marine reserve off Waiheke is proposed. And here's what you can do. Put pressure on politicians. Support protection and restoration. And sacrifice. Take one for the team, for the greater good. We need action now. Modi order. Seriously, how could you not want to get involved now? Let's go, let's do it. Let's save the Horaki Goals. Oh, oh, is that a bite? Oh. <laughs>